Michael Crichton as opposed to seeing like Jurassic Park and some of the other movies. It's very story driven, but the, there's no depth to the characters. There's like almost he does like Burroughs doesn't necessarily based in what we read. I haven't read much else of his. It's not like he de- we dove into the motivations of the characters in that excerpt of My Face or from Junkie, but well, I guess in Junkie we did, but it's like you said there's interpretation there to be had Crichton just drives the story forward you don't care about the motivations of his characters in his books it's and so I don't know just what you were talking about with Burroughs and the complexities of it just to I, I guess I was trying to make a comparison between somebody else who had a completely opposite but also successful style of writing ultimately that can sometimes be a really useful way to understand any any artist i hate the term artist i think it's pretentious and gibberish but for want of a better term any creative person's work is often best understood by contrasting it sharply the way that brett just did um I remember um, reading, I used to read a lot of J.G. Ballard, and uh, Ballard's a fascinating writer, very speculative. Also, another person, though, who, although he describes psychological motivation at at sometimes a very profound level, when it comes to dialogue, his characters are really superficial and wooden. And I remember um, somebody comparing, not favorably necessarily, comparing that to John le Carré, who wrote a lot of really downbeat, uh, sp- British spy novels uh, beginning in the 1960s. Um, uh, Le Carre, uh, whose name I think is actually Cornwall, David Cornwall, was in British intelligence for years, was writing under the name John Le Carre, writing about British intelligence, but it wasn't James Bond, it wasn't Ian Fleming, he hated that stuff, because his idea of British intelligence was it's grim and people lie to each other and it messes with their heads. And, you know, the British empire is dying and, and, you know, it was in the wake of the, the Philby uh, scandal and all that with all the infiltration of British intelligence and all that. Well, you know, again, both of those people are getting at, they're both British. They're both getting at the lives of the, of British thinkers and the British bourgeoisie, you know, the British middle class, but doing it in very different ways. And same thing with someone like, you know, Burroughs sometimes is described as a science fiction writer. Certainly a lot of what uh, Michael Crichton has written would qualify almost literally as science fiction. When you look at Andromeda Strain and, um, you know, obviously Jurassic Park, but a lot of the other things that he's written are the impact of science, a fictional account of the impact of science on, on a society and on people's lives, but at a kind of superficial level because the imperative for Crichton is not necessarily, I wanna give you a lot to think about. It's, I'm gonna tell you a great story that's gonna be like watching a movie. And in that he really, I mean, he. He's a hell of a storyteller, you know? Yeah, but Burroughs is not so much trying to tell you a story as he is trying to show you the inside of somebody's head. And not, that's not everybody's, you know, it's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, and, and I had, again, I had to be cautious and I, it's tedious to have to recount this, but I did have to be cautious about, you know, the sensibilities of individual students and things like that. Uh, in, in a perfect world or anything close to it, we would never have to do that. 10 years ago, I would never have had to do that. Um, when I first taught the politics in film class, for example, uh, that was probably 20, more than 20 years ago, right? One of the films in it was the, the Kubrick version of Clockwork Orange. Okay, now that is a fairly hardcore film and it's supposed to be, all right? But at that time, it it really, you know, it, because I remember talking with a lot of students and I had students write like personal reactions to films and things like that. I don't remember anyone being offended and there's violence, sexual violence, there's rape, there's all kinds of stuff in it. But it was people understood, this is a work of craft. This is a work of fiction. Um, And this is Kubrick's work. Right. This is no longer, you know, the author's work. This is Stanley Kubrick's statement about Clockwork Orange. I don't think I could do that now. I don't. I don't think that would necessarily be something that would would withstand scrutiny anymore. You know. So it's it's really tough to do this. It's part of the point of why I decided to include this, though, to let you know that 
you know, aesthetic parameters evolve over time and sometimes they regress. Sometimes we become, rather than more tolerant, we can regress and become less tolerant about what sort of creative expression we're allowing the creator to use. I, I think my suspicion is that looking back at this period of time, 50 years on, people will look back at this as a time of relative creative repression, where everything was commercialized, everything was about, you know, we have to get this onto HBO or Netflix or whatever. Very little, you know, powerful fiction or, or writing of any kind is being produced anymore. A, people don't read, and when they do read, they don't finish what they read. B, though, I think. When you put something on the printed page, people can reach back and get that again and again and again. And I think that a lot of creative people don't have the courage any longer to stand behind their work. You know, it's, it's easy to say, well, that was the director's interpretation, or yes, that actor did a lousy job of doing that, but the original script was money, it was nails. You know, there's a certain courage that is required of authentically, authentically innovative and creative people I don't get the sense that there's a lot of that going around the United States these days. That, that, is, that is a personal observation. I'm not trying to tell you it's so. That's my impression though. What do you, what do you think about that? Apparently nothing. I don't care. Who cares, man? That's pretty I would have, I'd have to agree. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, and I mean, I'm a, creative writing major and I'm working on a novel and whatnot and just I think your observations are accurate at the very least to, to the, the current creative climate um, with everything has to be like aimed towards marketability everything has to be within guidelines and just really choked down and restricted well, there's, yeah, and again, I'm not exercising this as a condemnation or moral judgment. I understand that people, you know, people, when they work hard on a, 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 a work of craft, right, I think now the expectation is they, that should be valued and they should be compensated. Um, that, what a lot of people don't realize, that's relatively modern. Um, when Burroughs was writing, to some extent, even when Kerouac was writing, they weren't initially making much money off of those things, if they made anything at all. They wrote because they couldn't not write. They couldn't stop themselves from writing. Burroughs wrote all the time. Burroughs wrote when he was almost incapacitated with heroin addiction in Tangiers. He still wrote when people would come to see him, right? And they would come to this dump that he was living in. There were just stacks of manuscripts, stacks of typewritten pages all kinds of work. He couldn't stop working, okay? Because that creativity or whatever you want to call it, it was like a faucet that was just left on all the time. And it was left on arguably because he had no fear of that. He, he was more than happy to own every syllable of every word. And he didn't want it to be marketable. He didn't care you know, if it was made into a movie or if it won awards or anything else. He just wanted to write. He, had, he felt he had something to say and he wanted to say it. I don't get the sense, and not just in the United States, but more particularly because it's the culture I know best. I don't think that that's been the case in the United States probably since the 1960s. Um, I think you, you see the change. The one thing I, I, I left out of this unit was originally I had some readings on music. Um, and because music is a medium, it's part of media, you know, and there's a music industry. Um, but I, I was, I am old enough to remember when rock became a culture industry instead of a kind of proletarian music, right? When it wasn't any longer this sense of, hey, let, you know, let's get a few mates together and have a band, yeah, oh, oh yeah, you know, and we'll, we'll do lots of drugs, right, and wear no clothing. It would be wonderful. And, and that was really fun. And all of us growing up were in garage bands. But you could see that it became corporate. You could see what happened with previously very experimental bands like Pink Floyd, or uh, even what Frank Zappa was doing. He was really fighting to keep that, to keep the edge on that music. But by the 1980s, 
everyone was kind of coming after him for what he was doing. You know, well, Frank, Frank Zappa is a race. Frank Zappa is a sexist. Frank Zappa is this and that and this and that and this and that. And, you know, notwithstanding, well, wait a minute, does his music stand up? And, you know, people stopped listening and started condemning. So this, this thing we're going through right now, this kind of what people generally call it cancel culture or whatever, it's got its roots in the 1980s and the reaction to what we used to refer to with all due respect, whatever that would mean to Christianity as the great Jesus scare, okay? And the idea was that American culture was going to be dragged back down to earth by main force by evangelical Christianity. And we were writing about that and talking about that in the late 70s when we were just like post adolescents. Turns out we were right, which is why I included the hegemony in the 60s article, because that article, which we're gonna get to in a second, boy, how's that for a smooth transition? Damn, you could think I could do this for a living, right? Um, but the idea there is, it, it, when you read that, it's like, well, where are the, where are the, where's the discussion of media here? That's not why it's there. I put it there because um, I thought it was important for us to have some historical context when people start talking about things like the culture war and all that, because all of the culture war is driven by media. Rush Limbaugh just did the first decent thing in his adult life yesterday by dying at the age of 70, okay? I mean, he was not about being decent in the same sense that William Burroughs was not about telling you a story. You know, um, Rush Limbaugh was a provocateur. Rush Limbaugh was an opportunist. He was, he was, he was self-indulgent the way every chatterbox is, right? Um, when it's just their opinion. And he showed how you could monetize that. You know, the last contract that he signed was for, a, you know, it was for a quarter of a billion dollars, you know? That's a lot of money to pay a guy who doesn't really know very much to talk nonstop for hours at a time about things he really doesn't understand. But he had a way of doing that that's part of this, it's part of this struggle for and against hegemony. He felt himself as, at least his character was counterpoised against what he saw as the hegemonic left the hegemonic liberalism of post-60s America. And a lot of people um, actually really took that to heart and took it seriously. And they did feel that they were at war with those voices of dissent that had conquered tradition and conquered conservatism. Never mind that that's not an accurate narrative at all. It doesn't matter. Reality no longer matters because the culture war is not really fought out by us sitting around and having a beer and talking in a bar. It's fought out by a media, okay? And the notion of hegemony is, or, or hegemony as I refer to it, uh, I, I always have to change that pronunciation so I don't freak people out. But anyway, that idea is absolutely reinforced by media. The use of media, the control of media, um, the, the decomposition of media, the critique of media and everything else. All of that is, that's the fundamental mechanism of what you know people like Foucault called a regime of truth, okay? that hegemony requires a regime of truth. That is, you know, this is the truth. This is the only language that you can use to describe the truth, okay? So why don't we move into that? Um, and this, uh, Liam, you're doing this and also, let me see, let me see, let me see, I gotta, um, yeah, Lillian, you're here as well. I don't know which of you wants to go first, but I will leave that to you. Who wants to go first? I mean, I'll start. You want to dive in there? Sure. Okay. Uh, where exactly do you want us to start? Could I could just start at the top of my notes. Well, first of all, give give us an idea of when we talk about hegemony in this context in, in the 1960s. What are we? Let's start with that. What are we really talking about when we're talking about hegemony? Already. I actually have a blurb on that. Okay, so prior to the 60s, the word hegemony was um, associated mostly with like imperialism and like imperialistic ideals and, and um, whatnot. And then uh, through the 60s and afterwards, um, and in, especially in recent years, um, in part due to America um, becoming the sole superpower and also due to conservative policy from that has, um, been greatly influenced by the 60s, um, that definition of, of like relating to uh, 
imperialism and whatnot has come back into prominence. Um, and then I just ripped out of the text that the uh, US hegemony abroad is the same, is, is also the same force and aim of like the hegemonic ideals at home. That wasn't really an explanation of hegemony. No, but I think um, you're getting there. I, I would say, let's give it another go, but you certainly are getting there, you know? In other words, what's the difference? Let's sometimes, again, we'll contrast it, right? See, what is the difference between, let us say, hegemony and dominance? Uh, or is there a difference between? Um, I think that Perhaps uh, hegemony relates more to um, an influence over others, um, like a, a social, cultural, ideological dominance over others versus um, like mili ne not necessarily like militaristic might, maybe. Is that getting anywhere close? Well, if there's no militaristic might, is hegemony real power? Good question. Lillian, oh. do you have anything on that? Um, I mean, what I have, I mean, I looked up the actual definition on Google of what hegemony was, and it said it is a political, economic, or military predominance over, like, or control over one state over others. Well, that's, this is the, it's sort of like using Webster's Dictionary or something, right? In other words, there's a, there's a concept of hegemony that really transcends dictionary definitions. That is not an inaccurate definition, nor is it though a comprehensive definition. So the first thing you have to think about is what are the moving parts of hegemony? People talk about a hegemonic um, domination or a hegemonic preeminence. Um, often they speak, and, and this is derived from the work of Antonio Gramsci, okay? This idea of an internal hegemony, a cultural hegemony, hege this is what I was referring to with the regime of truth, the idea that to the extent that you control discourse, you control narrative. To the extent that you control narrative, you control truth. To the extent that you control truth, you control the world. Whatever that world is, however it is circumscribed. That world meaning your, you know, your domestic population, your sphere of influence in the world, or the entire globe. Okay, so you you'll hear people use the term, and this is especially appropriate in the '60s, cultural hegemony. Okay. So then, is is a hegemony just by that definition and um, explanation that you've given? Is it by nature authoritarian? In, authoritarian? No, not so much authoritarian. If it's anything, it's almost closer to being totalitarian. That mm. is a full mobilization of a society. Where that becomes confusing though for the United States in particular, almost none of this is exercised by the government. The American government does remarkably little to influence American culture compared to other private institutions, okay? Private media institutions. Um, you know, we, uh, we mentioned Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh was part of a um, reactionary hegemonic struggle in media, right? He was you know, one of the, the people who was really out right on the front lines of that going all the way back to when he was still in Sacramento in the 1980s. Um, and the idea, what they were arguing over is the same thing that people were arguing over for four years of Trump. They were arguing over the truth, okay? Again, because the, the calculus is, if you control the narrative, you control what's true. If you control what's true, you control the narrative, you control the world. You control that world, okay? For example, um, think about this in terms of culture wars. The place of religion. The United States has relentlessly become more and more and more secular over the last 50 years. What that means is that a higher and higher percentage of people either are ambivalent about religion or describe themselves as being possessed of no religion whatsoever. This is not the same as people saying whether or not they believe in God. Belief in God is not religion. Belief in God, purely speaking, is spiritualism. That is the belief in 
some unknowable force, power, existence, or being that in some way is instrumental to the unfolding of the events and, and, and situations of the world. That's not religion. Religion is the way of claiming ownership of that. Religion becomes the hegemonic exercise. You build institutions to capture that narrative in the form of religious dogma, religious scripture, whatever it is. So you can see like the, uh, the Catholic church, right? The Roman church achieving hegemony over most of Europe, right? For centuries, okay? That's classic cultural hegemony. And it is that kind of hegemony that, you know, the, the imprisoned Sardinian, you know, uh, Antonio Gramsci was writing about when he was talking about hegemony, the extraordinary power of people either to capture or to create institutions that can embody um, control over a narrative about what is or is not, okay? So it, again, this does not require nuclear weapons. It's always nice to have them in your back pocket, but you, you, know, you don't wanna rely on them, okay? Um, you can think of, you know, we've talked a little bit about anti-communism. That's part of a hegemonic narrative that anything to the left of, you know, Hubert Humphrey is radicalism and is gonna overthrow the government and the barbarians are at the gates and they all have long hair and beards and they stink of patchouli oil. You know, I give you the 1960s and early 1970s, right? Well, that was played out as a life and death struggle for the soul of America, okay? And that's what this article is trying to get at. And they talk about a, a kind of paradox about how, you know, tell me about the radicalism of the 60s and how that's interpreted here in terms of the, the ultimate hegemonic monolith being um, consumer capitalism. I mean, that's the, that's the core, the institutional core of American hegemony is consumer capitalism. So what's going on? What the, the 60s are clearly pushing against that. How are the 60s pushing against that? You know, we're going we're gonna to talk more specifically about that when we talk about Gonzo and Hunter Thompson and people like that. But tell me about what consumer capitalism is. Um, tell me about the instrumental place of that in not only in American culture, but in American politics. This is a history with which you should be very familiar. Is America a capitalist country? Yes. All right. What does that mean? Okay. So, um, capitalism is kind of the economic policy of. Okay. Capitalism is not kind of anything. Now I'm real, we got to be really we got to be really precise about this. Um, when we say that America is capitalist, and I'm not just asking you. Anybody wants to jump in here, feel free. But when we say of America, this is a capitalist country. It's not like when, is it is it the same as when we say this is a Christian nation? No. Is America a Christian nation? Not a no. Christian. No. No. It's not but it's constantly being described as such, usually, but not always, by cultural conservatives. Because the idea is we have to repeat relentlessly the narrative of America as a fundamentally Christian nation because then our case for the assault on Christianity is in bold relief. Because if this is something that's fundamental to our identity as Americans, then don't we want to preserve it? Well, not, no, not necessarily, because we're not a Christian nation. It's the difference between a nation, the majority of whom might describe themselves as Christians, and a Christian nation, where Christianity is the national credo. It isn't in the United States. It is for many Americans, but it isn't official, okay? By the same token, though, is capitalism the official economic credo of the United States and its people? Yes. Are most Americans technically actually capitalists? No. 
You know, most of us do not control stock, do not control the value of, of things around us. Even if we have a house, the bank probably owns it and we're paying for the privilege of living there until someday we hope we can live long enough and not be laid off and get paid enough money so that we can pay for it. That's not a capitalist. The capitalist is someone who owns and controls the means of production. Yeah, Monica. Just to clarify, so the definition is right in my head. Um, so just because you're participating in a capitalist system doesn't make you a capitalist. Does that mean that in a communist system, if you were within the system but weren't necessarily controlling the system, that doesn't make you a communist? Absolutely. In fact, in the Soviet Union, there was never more than about 10% of that population, by most estimates, no more than 15, who were actually members of the Communist Party. Yes, sure. Because this is hegemony. Hegemony is the terms of order as established by the dominant stratum of the society. The dominant stratum of the Soviet Union's society was the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, okay? Just as right now, the dominant stratum in China is the Communist Party of China. And more specifically, the Red Army. Okay, that is the single dominant institution in China. And so that which passes for values and sort of hegemonic imperative has a source. And that source is the Communist Party of China and the Red Army, just as it was the Kremlin and the Politburo in the Soviet Union. It wasn't the people. Okay, now, we can think of that in, in you know, totalitarian or absolutist societies, but one of the notions of hegemony is, doesn't that apply to non-absolutist societies in the sense of not being fascist, not being communist? In other words, could the concept of hegemony, right, could that apply to a nominally free country like the United States? That's what I'm trying to get you to think about, okay. Okay, tell me about the radical 60s. You must have looked at least at that part with, with some, some curiosity. What was okay. radical about the 60s? All righty, so um, the 60s were um, a time of great social movements and change like with the black um, movement that was like with like MLK and then uh, women's rights. Well, okay, and... let's, we've gotta be careful here. Okay, you can't throw these things out vaguely Okay, what was radical? What is radicalism? And what was, what was the nature of radicalism in the 60s? What does it mean to be a radical? Is a radical the same as a reformer? Um, Sorry, Lillian, I cut you off and I didn't mean to. Oh, no, you're okay. I was just gonna say, um, kind of, I, I mean, what I got from it was that they mainly just formulated critiques on the society they were living within. Let me, let me help you a little bit. The talk here is about cultural rebellion. In the article, I am on page 212, okay? This is the next to last paragraph. It begins, cultural transformations in the period after the Second World War tended to assist a new dynamic of capital accumulation centered on consumerism. Okay, this was an imperative of the American political economy after the Second World War, okay? It was even built into National Security Council Memorandum 68, NSC 68. That was the blueprint for the Cold War, given to Harry Truman in 1950, only months before our intervention in, in Korea, okay? And the idea there was, you know, when they're critiquing Soviet socialism, there's, you know, there's a moral argument about the slave state as opposed to the free peoples and all that, but also they're showing the extraordinary industrial ex, um, expansion and growth and productivity of the Soviet Union. And they're terrified of that. So the idea is we need to sustain relentless consumerism, but coming out of the, the trauma of the depression, more than the Second World War, the trauma of the depression in the United States, We've got a culture of savers and not spenders, all right? So the idea is you see all the forces, the private forces of corporate America, of businesses large and small, geared toward new kinds of marketing to stimulate new modalities of consumerism, 
So what we're doing is we're breaking, you know, a decades, if not centuries long tradition in the United States of being relatively uh, sort of penny pinching, saving conservative Americans. And we're, we're, we're going to unleash, you know, the floodgates and into this rampant era of consumerism. Okay. In other words, we're cutting right down to the core of the economy. And what we need to do, we need to rev up demand. But the biggest part of that demand is not even, to some extent, it's our external markets, but domestic consumption. We've got this amazing physical plant that was fully mobilized by the Second World War. Okay, All these people are in these factories. We've got a new middle class. If, if people go back to saving, all of that's going to contract and we're going to go into another, we're certainly going to go into a deep recession. We could break the back of American capitalism. Okay. All right, so that's the first thing that's happening, okay. But then you follow that up, okay. Television was significant in this, particularly though the creation of the teenager, through the creation of the teenager, but so too was the development of suburbia. So we have these new institutions, and one of them is media. The fundamental medium of consumer capitalism is television. To this day, there's no single medium more important, okay. That is viewing on a screen right? That which is either narrow cast or broadcast in some way, okay? Sounds and, and, and image, okay? And you can use that to create an existence that never was before, the teenager. No one talked about teenagers before that. Why were teenagers created? They're a marketing niche. They're created for consumer capitalism. They're borrowing from psychology, but not for the purposes of better insights into, you know, American adolescence. They're borrowing from psychology to figure out how to stimulate demand in 13 to 19 year olds as a pent up source of capital for consumer spending. Everything is being commodified. Everything, you know, at some point is being evaluated fundamentally for its value as an as a good or service of consumption? Can it make a profit? Is it monetizable? Okay. So then what's the reaction to that with, with you know, the 60s and, and all that? What's the reaction? I can tell you what it isn't, okay? It isn't civil rights and it isn't even really feminism. It really isn't. See, most of you, when you think of the 60s, you think of feminism and civil rights. And, and, and of course, those are important forces. But we know that civil rights in particular, you know, the gains of civil rights have been stunningly modest in many ways. But, you know, what does it mean to be a radical? It means to go to the source of something. In other words, you're no longer reforming at the edges. You're going to destroy a village to save it. You're going to go to the heart of the problem, okay? And you're gonna cut out what's wrong there and remove it and, and, and then you can improve. The challenge when you do that, when you become a radical is that the hard part isn't necessarily the removal of the institution as an impediment. It's what you replace it with if you replace it with anything at all. So the challenge for radicalism, and especially let's just say cultural radicalism, the so-called culture wars, is that, okay, you challenge fundamentally American institutions of authority, American institutions of consensus, American institutions of morality and values. You go after the church and the state and corporate America, okay? And you point your finger at every one of them as part of the root problem of what is wrong. You know, if you, if you read uh, the Port Huron statement, it's clear, okay. Almost nothing there, nothing at all there said about feminism. This is 1962. But there's a lot there about middle-class Americans being this kind of affluent class with no point. In other words, yeah, we're, we've got this new affluence and more and more of us are growing up in relative comfort, right? But our lives are meaningless. 
And so what can we do? Well, we need to democratize things. You know, we need to transform this. Okay. So what's the radical version of that? Think of like the hippies or think of, you know, people like Burroughs or, you know, radical writers, radical musicians. What are they doing? What makes them radicals? What, why, what was their means of war? What were the, what were the rules they, of engagement for that combat? They were breaking away from that social expectation of what was to be their life and forging their own path through their writing, through um, being uh, kind of like migratory vagrants kind of. What does it mean to be a migratory vagrant? Because most of middle-class America certainly didn't do that. Um, I, uh, the figure that's coming immediately to mind is like Jack Kerouac, basically, for me. Like, I don't know. That was 1957. I kind of just said it. Yeah. That was 1957. Never mind. Okay, but but you know, let's let's see if we can get at this. Um, I, I get the feeling that for a lot of you, this article was kind of baffling. One of the things that's mentioned in here, okay, on page 213, are a lot of the intellectual flashpoints here. One of them was um, was the publication by Herbert Marcuse, right, of a, a book called One Dimensional Man. Okay, and um, this was, uh, Marcuse fled uh, Europe uh, during the um, Second World War, it was part of what was called the Frankfurt School, you know, a very radical um, philosophy. And one of the things that he wrote about a one-dimensional man was the, the kind of operationalization of language, to take language away from its spontaneous modalities of communication and to assign to it specific meanings to constrain thought by manipulating language, okay? It's an interesting idea, but what it leads to for Marcuse writing in the United States, grateful not to have been trapped in, you know, um, in Nazi Germany or, uh, you know, communist Russia or anything else, right? He's arguing that the United States in the 1960s is a totalitarian country, okay? Now, on what possible basis could he argue that? The government is, is, is very little involved in our direct day-to-day -day lives. In fact, less so than it is now. But why, this guy wasn't stupid, you know? So, you know, what would make him think that? That, you know, th he was writing about hegemony. He was writing about, you know, the idea of a culture of domination and repression, but it wasn't at the barrel of a gun. An important instrument of it was the control of language and the control of meaning. That's a regime of truth. Okay, so for the radical, one way to pick that lock and open that door is to reclaim control of language. Now, I'll tell you what this means. Now, think about what young people of every generation do. Every generation is distinguished to a certain degree by the vernacular that identifies it. The use of language in certain ways, the use of words in certain ways, okay? That, and it's almost encoded speech. In other words, the people around you may not understand what you're saying, that's fine. But you understand and you're claiming new meaning for the words you use. That's counter hegemonic, okay? So that, for example, when I was a kid and we said that something was bad, what we really meant was it was the coolest thing we'd ever seen, okay? But it freaked out our parents and it freaked out all the, the nerds who didn't know what we were saying. And that was fine because we were determining what we meant by the way we used language. And there was a lot more than that. You know, think about where a lot of your language comes from. A lot of your language comes from memes. And it comes from, you know, it comes from little tropes in, in you know, I don't know, things that sort of go viral. Okay. And, and so you have to ask yourself, what real control do you have over language? This is one of the things that Marcuse was talking about. You know, this is why television is so important because television has a relatively narrow bandwidth of permissible 
content at this time. This is the 60s and even into the 70s. You know, you can almost never swear on television. And, you know, and we know that using, using swearing is, is, it's a way of emphasizing things and, and, and galvanizing attention so that we can then go on and now, now that you're listening, you know, I can say this, okay? But you weren't allowed to do that on television. It's one of the few areas where the government did have a mechanism of censorship, the FCC, okay? And in the 1960s, the FCC is supremely powerful. So much so that in an episode of, there was a, used to be a show in the 50s and was about this collie dog called Lassie, right? And I hated the damn show. There was this little kid, I think his name was Jimmy or something like that. And he was always getting in trouble. And that's the first time I got in trouble for calling somebody an ass. Was I turned to my own man and was like, that kid's an ass, you know? because he's always doing stupid shit, right? But there was an episode where Lassie had puppies, okay? And they were gonna kind of show that on TV. But what happened was people, mostly religious conservatives of all people, wrote in and complained that that was obscene. Now, again, that was a small minority of the people who viewed that, that episode and watched that show. But because they complained, the SEC now had jurisdiction to go in with complaints, to formal complaints, okay? That's the kind of power the FCC had. And that's the kind of power sponsors had. Okay, sponsorship control of television was paramount. This was before networks had the power and the sponsor had exclusive power because a lot of um, episodic television had a single sponsor. And if the sponsor said no, that program didn't get aired. Understand, that's not government censorship. That's private censorship. Creating a hegemonic narrative. Right? So that, you know, a, a company responsible for, for the delivery of natural gas can scrap a teleplay that's made about concentration camps because the concentration camps used gas. And the sponsor says, we can't do that because people are going to associate that with what we do and we can't have that. That episode does not go to air. So that a puppet show in the 1960s, right? Made in Britain and sent over here had integrated puppets in it. The Southern affiliates said, we cannot air this. There will be massive outrage. So that show initially could not be aired in the South because people did not want to see even puppets integrated. And then they had to reshoot those with white puppets if they wanted it aired in Southern affiliates. That's a struggle against hegemony, okay? So what's a radical to do in the 60s? What makes the 60s radical? What makes, them, what's, what makes people radical? Think about the free speech movement. What were they complaining about? Because this is early, this is 63 in Berkeley. What's the free speech movement about? What kind of free speech? Okay, here's what we're gonna do. I, I got the sneak and suspicion that most of you have not been able to read this article and get anything from it. Oh, hi. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. We're gonna do this wow. next week. Um, before we go on with the rest of the module, we're gonna revisit this. In the meantime, okay, I want the two presenters in particular to look up some terms, and I don't mean Google them, I mean look them up, okay? Look up hegemony, all right? Um, look up Herbert Marcuse, M-A-R-C-U-S-E, he's in the article, and find out what one-dimensional man was about, okay? Try to look into try you can you can exchange emails, you can, you know, you can divide the work up however you want. I really don't care. But when you encounter something like this that doesn't make sense to you, break it down into its components parts. You know, do some what was a 60s radical? What does that mean? Because the, the idea here is these so-called 60s radicals fighting this culture war, yeah, they were radical, but oddly enough, they ushered in this generation of turbo capitalism which was antithetical to everything that they were fighting for. Because a lot of them, when they got older, they decided, 
well, now I got kids or now I got investments or now I want to make money. And, and so they, they had broken down these institutional barriers. Okay. And they were responding to that and exploiting. Okay. Because I, the reason why I got this article is it was the closest I've ever seen to anything that kind of tries to make sense of the 60s as something other than just, you know, long hair and beads and patchouli and acid. You know, that, that, that there's a political economy to all of this. So we're going to revisit this. Um, you know, I mean, no uh, chastising implied there, but, you know, we need more information. We need, as, as um, Blixa from Einstein's in my Walton said very loudly in a live show, we need more high frequencies. So that's, we don't have those sufficient high frequencies. All right. So instead, let's look at Gonzo. So either Brett or Jared, dive in, tell me. Uh, I didn't realize I had somebody with me on this one. <laughs> but that's okay, I'll start. Ah, so Gonzo Journalism and Hunter S. Thompson, kind of the same thing. Really, the argument could be made that <clears throat> Hunter S. Thompson is the only true Gonzo journalist who ever really wrote in that style. Um, he was an interesting guy. To understand Gonzo journalism, you have to understand Hunter S. Thompson. And he just did pretty much exactly what he wanted to do all of the time and went and wrote about the, He wasn't much of one for taking orders. Um, and he went and observed some really interesting aspects of American culture during his lifetime. Um, this isn't really discussed super thoroughly, but his first big break came from living with the Hells Angels and writing uh, an article and then later a book about them. Yeah. They did not take kindly to and almost killed him over, but that didn't stop him. Like he just kept doing, doing what he was doing. In the article, um, the author did one of the worst things you could do and use a dictionary definition to describe something as abstract as Gonzo journalism. But it is very subjective. Um, it's perhaps, I, he used the term factual distortion. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. I think Hunter S. Thompson was telling you just exactly what he was experiencing in that moment. So to another observer might not have interpreted that way, but you probably weren't as drunk or as high as Hunter S. Thompson was while that was going on either. That was another important part of Gonzo journalism was his altered state of mind to kind of, he used drugs to get himself into an altered state of mind to give him what he perceived as a clearer path to broader truths. So um, he himself doesn't consider Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas true gonzo journalism because it got edited and some of the stories were embellished. And he was a, <laughs> I don't think he would have gone on well in this class because he was a first draft, best draft writer. <laughs> he wrote it down on paper once and sent it off. So another important element of gonzo journalism was the editing. The editors had to understand what it was that they were looking at on the page and not substantively change the journalistic experience that Hunter Thompson was putting forth into the world. Um, okay, let's stop there because um, you, you've, you've You've given us several things to think about. Okay, first thing is um, you're right. The idea that trying to define Gonzo with a dictionary definition, you know, it's kind of like trying to explain to people how to walk. You kind of have to do it. Um, but also, what I wanted you to think about, and you were right on the edge of doing it, is when we were talking earlier about William Burroughs. And, and what he was trying to capture with his writing. Understand that Thompson grew up reading the beats. He was influenced profoundly by them, okay? And so he is, in a sense, sort of like William Burroughs' son, in a way, you know, intellectually, that he's, he's grown up with that as the sort of counter-hegemonic narrative of permission for his life. You know, Brett points out that, you know, Thompson didn't really care if you agreed with him or if you didn't like what he wrote or anything else. It was that same courage on the page that we saw with Burroughs. And for the same reason, and again, Brett points this out, he was creating an impression, not of a factual linear narrative of, of, of a moment, 
but of the impression that that moment made upon him. Okay, so it was necessarily subjective, but it wasn't completely fiction. Okay, much of what Burroughs wrote about, right, was however abstractly des descriptions of things that he was living and states of mind within which he functioned. So, you know, one of the things that, that Brett's done here, whether intentionally or otherwise, is draw a wonderful connective narrative between what people like Burroughs were trying to do and roughly a generation later, what people like Thompson, and there weren't very many of them, as you suggest, were trying to do, which was, again, if hegemony is the regime of truth, what is the one thing that the William Burroughs and the Hunter Thompsons are trying to use literature to do? Tell the truth. But it's not the truth that the Republicans and Democrats want you to hear. And it's not the truth that you know, General Electric wants you to hear, okay? It's the truth that you, that you experience walking around every day on the street and they're trying to make sense of it for you, to show you, no, this is really what you're seeing, okay? So that's quite good. That's quite good. Uh, Jared, you want to pick up from there or what do you think? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I agreed with what you said about um, surjective. That's that's what I was getting from a lot of these was that, um, you know, it seemed like journalism, um, at least from what we've read building up to this was um, like the conventional journalism was like to not put yourself in it, you know, to leave it kind of objective in a way. Um, and I felt like with Gonzo journalism, you know, they were more about like, the best fiction is is truer than the truth. I think I read um, somewhere um, from, you know, like basically saying that um, um, what I have, I have my notes, like objectivity is the myth and it just gets in the way of the truth, you know? And I felt like I was seeing- Yeah, that sounds like Hunter Thompson. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's what I was getting from his two articles um, was that, you know, he really um, was labeling, you know, and, and using a lot of, um, like Brett was saying that, you know, like, the drugs, I don't think necessarily had to be in it for it to be gonzo journalism, but I think the drugs made his perception of what was happening and like the altered state of it, you know, uh, in his opinion, more true, but in reality, it really did alter the truth. Um, and um, I guess I could uh, talk about the Nixon article um, that Hunter Thompson talked about. And I thought it was really interesting because, you know, he obviously leads into it talking about how like there was obviously only one choice for presidency and he really like shows his um, opinion of Nixon, you know, like right off the bat. And then, but all, but it also talks about how his encounter with him in the car, pretty much at the end of it, about how like he slightly gained a little bit of respect, I, though he didn't really like say it like that, you know, cause he ends it basically saying, um, you know, more bad things about him and stuff. And like, you know, that though it's a new Nixon or an old Nixon, you know, it's still the same Nixon and stuff. But I found like that, that, that interaction with him, the way that he narrated, that he explained it was like, um, I don't know, it kind of gave me a little bit more of a personal connection with Thompson, I thought, than th how it built up to it, where it was just, you know, him like pile driving. Because I read somewhere that he's really verb driven with the way that he uh, narrates and stuff, yeah. Because his, his narrative, um, it, it's like uh, when, when Liam mentioned um, uh, Jack Kerouac, okay, and On the Road, that was a very influential novel. And what it's about is that constant driving forward, that notion of forward movement. But I wanna just take a second here. And to, this is the kind of thing that no journalist could write, but that everyone was thinking. And it's one of the most brilliant pieces of writing I, I would argue that Thompson ever did. This is from his, his the brief piece on Nixon. And I'm just gonna read a little bit of this, okay? Richard Nixon has never been one of my favorite people anyway. For years, I regarded his very existence as a, as a monument to all the rancid genes and broken chromosomes that corrupt the possibilities of the American dream. He was a foul caricature of himself, a man with no soul, no inner convictions, with the integrity of a hyena, and the style of a poisoned toad. Okay, again, that first of all, that's brilliant writing, but also it's really trenching. He's, he's really, he is again, he's saying, you can't stop me from using this language this way. It's what Jared was suggesting. Objectivity is an illusion, it just gets in the way. Here's, here's the thing. He's also giving you full disclosure. 
before I go any further, let me tell you what I think about this guy. Because when the story evolves, you get almost a kind of grudging respect for Nixon that emerges in peculiar ways. But if Nixon was one of the most fundamental um, characters of the 1960s, and he was, okay, the six, and I say the 60s advisedly, okay, because he's not elected president until 68 and is not inaugurated until January of 69, right? He though is very much a president of those times. Those forces of radicalism and dissent uh, of civil rights and anti-war and everything, all of the core predicates of the culture war wash up like foul sewage on the steps of the White House when Nixon is there, even more than Lyndon Johnson, when Nixon is there, okay? And so what Thompson is doing is saying, yeah, I gotta figure out who the hell this guy is. I gotta, I gotta crack this code. And, and he writes aggressively and in a very American way, because again, this is a guy who is trying to tell the truth as he understands it, okay? And he's criticizing a lot of journalists who hide behind what Jared suggested is that illusion of objectivity, which is pretty much permission for them to bullshit, you know? So anyway, either, either of you wanna uh, continue with that? I mean, both of these analyses I think are really solid. You both clearly get this, but um, what can we learn now? Can we learn anything from uh, Hunter Thompson or can we, where did we go from there? You know, the hegemony in the 60s article suggests that a lot of the, the roiling of culture war in the 60s ultimately played out in a way that people in the 60s hadn't really anticipated. Um, did Hunter Thompson and that style of writing, did it liberate us? Did it help us rediscover truth? Or did it lead us afoul? What do you think? Um, well, I, yeah, I have a, a kind of a side question about the same thing. I was, I was curious what was popping in my head was like, not necessarily every documentary, but kind of in a sense, like I felt like the way that documentaries are done kind of fit the same guidelines a little bit um, of like, um, you know, they, they really push views. Sometimes they're first, uh, uh, first person narratives, um, you know, typically like real raw and stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of like where I was thinking that Gonzo journalism is kind of like, you know, helped fuel, I guess, in a sense, but there's tons of documentaries that don't fit it. So you, I couldn't really, you know, embrace it, but I felt like there was some thing, at least like how documentaries touch people at least or something, you know? Well, one of the really profound influences that Thompson did have was on journalists covering presidential campaigns. And Timothy Krause in his book, Boys on the Bus, really does an interesting job of, of chronicling that and, and showing in large part how other mainstream journalists responded to Hunter Thompson. And they didn't always know what to make of the things that he said because, um, you know, yeah, Hunter might be just making it up. On the other hand, people talk to Hunter and say things they don't say to other people. And as a consequence of that, in beginning in the 1980s, for a variety of reasons. One of the things we move toward is what we see now where, and we'll talk about this more in the next module. One of the most striking phenomena of so-called journalism in the United States is how little of it is actually journalism anymore and how much of it is commentary, okay? And a lot of those people would claim as a legitimate legacy, Hunter Thompson. Well, this is what Hunter was telling us to do in the late 60s and early 70s. Hunter Thompson, I don't think would have agreed with that. That's one of the points I was going to make. Okay, why don't you follow through on that, Brett? Well, just that Hunter Thompson, like, he was a journalist. He wasn't necessarily, he wasn't an objective journalist, but he was a journalist. He was open about how he experienced things and what it was that he was there to experience. He wrote a piece, a very famous piece about the decadence of the Kentucky Derby. Um and he just, he, I, maybe it was aspects of his personality or his personal habits that made his style of journalism easy to attack and degrade because he wasn't, he wasn't a guy in a pressed suit with a, you know, a pencil behind his ear ready to, you know, what like that, that classic image of, you know, maybe like a late 19th century reporter, but, um, he, uh, 
he certainly left a legacy, but he he was honest. He was honest on the page. He wasn't always necessarily trying to tell. I mean, you end up with a fairly, at least personally positive view of Nixon at the end of that article, starting with one of the most, with quite a bit of vitriol at the beginning, but then he's able to sit down and talk about about football with the guy and. So it's just his, his style, his outlook on things. He was clearly a very open-minded person and he used that to uh, experience a, a wide, well, one of the, out of the uh, strange rumblings in Aslan piece, I, I think for me, this sums up Hunter Thompson. He was at the same time he was covering the American Legion convention and the Sky River Rock Festival. Like they were happening over the same weekend in Washington. And he thought these are similar enough that I can, I can cover both of these events at the same time. Um, for anybody who doesn't know the American Legion is a veterans association. So we were, we've been dealing with a lot of world war two era greatest generation type people. And, you know, the early days of, you know, rock and roll really hitting hitting the scene in the late 60s and he just figured same thing one weekend i got it that was a kind of the uh i wouldn't call it arrogance but confidence that he had in his journalistic abilities and just his personality just led to the kind of writing that well one of the things that that hunter thompson was responding to uh, the more that he took on mainstream assignments, the kind that Brett's talking about, where they were saying, well, you, know, you go cover this, you know, this speech by the president, or he did a very, very interesting piece on um, covering the early campaign efforts of Jimmy Carter. Okay. But what he saw was what Timothy Krause wrote about as pack journalism in Boys on the Bus. And that was that there were, there were scenes described in Boys on the Bus that Krause writes about where there would be a press conference. And in 1972, the Nixon um, campaign did everything it could to isolate the press from the candidate. This became more and more the norm, okay? And so his, almost his whole uh, 68 campaign, um, I've been on television, 72, no exception. Okay, one of the things that would happen is that reporters would all be sitting there and they'd be taking their notes and everything. And then immediately after that, there was a guy by the name of, his last name was Means, from um, uh, the Associated Press. They would all hover around him and get him to tell them what's the lead. One guy telling the entire press corps, this is the lead, okay? And, you know, fortunately, Mises was a very good reporter and very conscientious, but that even he was struck at times by, you know, what that said about a nominally free press who were looking to be told, okay, what's important here? They, that some of them lacked that instinct. And the reason why they did was because they were struggling constantly with this notion of objectivity. I don't want to impose my personality or my perspective on this story, right? So Thompson, among others, saw this and thought, this is garbage. I know what's important here. It's this. And he'd go off on a tangent someplace. And he, you know, he made up this thing about, you know, one of the candidates getting this mysterious drug called Ibogaine and, and it was a hallucinogen and all this kind of stuff. Well, some reporters picked that up and, and started asking questions about it. And Thompson just said, you know, yeah, you know, whatever. So he was simultaneously reporting on things but engaging in the narrative and helping to drive it, okay? Now what we have increasingly, we don't have people who are interested in telling the truth, but increasingly what we have, okay, and I've noticed this especially on uh, CNN and MSNBC. We have people who are careerists, and the way for them to advance their careers is to speak in opinions, you know. And, and that's that's all you hear. All right, the so-called anchors. So they often refer to themselves now as correspondents because they can't call themselves journalists because they're not. Okay, and they'll say, uh, well. You know, they'll, they'll rather than cover a story or allow people to speak, they'll frame the story with their own opinions and their own views. I've seen this happen in local. One of the reasons I don't do local media anymore, okay, and haven't for a long time, is the reporters would come to me 
um, you know, because I, I stopped going out to Medford, it was just not worth it. They'd already have the story created in their head. And they would frame questions to try to box me in to get me to say what they wanted me to say to finish their story. And of course, I don't play nice because I'd rather tell what I believe to be the truth, okay? This has become widespread practice. Partly it's driven by the deadlines and imperatives of a 24 hour news cycle. But increasingly it's driven by this desire by what would have been journalists and now are celebrities, right? To get the big contracts, to be the important in quotes news anchors or correspondents and, and to make their time in front of the screen be at least as much about them as is about what they're talking about. All of those things are to some extent characteristic of Hunter Thompson, even at his best, okay? But I would suggest that the difference is, it relates back to that notion of hegemony. Hunter Thompson was pushing relentlessly against that the inertia of hegemony. Whereas MSNBC, CNN, you know, Fox News, whatever, they're, they're like this with the hegemonic terms of order. This myth, of an ideologically polarized media is exactly that. If the locus of contact is hegemonic control, none of them, none of them in any significant degree are challenging that. None, none of them are challenging fundamentally the hegemony or the duopoly of the two private organizations, the Republicans and the Democrats in determining our political uh, destiny at any given time. No one is challenging that. In, in, in the mainstream media on any side. And that includes Fox. They're not challenging it, they live by it. They live by the idea that Republicans are irreconcilable in their differences with Democrats. They've monetized it. But increasingly, so has MSNBC, so has CNN. It's not journalism. That can ar be argued to be, however unintended, a legacy of the influence of people like Hunter Thompson, okay? So when you look at that Hunter Thompson article, and again, it's not an indictment against Hunter Thompson. That's not the point. In fact, quite far from it. The, the two things I put in there are examples of Hunter Thompson at his finest. There's no one writing like that right now. Really, Matt Taibbi thinks he is, but he's not. Because Matt Taibbi has made the whole thing about him. What he learned from Hunter Thompson, particularly in his writings for Rolling Stone, make the story about me. I'm more interesting than the story. That happened with Hunter Thompson later. He stayed on too long, like a rock star who didn't know when to retire, didn't know when to hang it up. But in his younger writing, there was this sense that he, his was an innocence lost spontaneously in front of us. You know, you see him losing his innocence by against all every instinct that he has, finding himself somewhat respectful of Richard Nixon. He's just a guy, you know. Um, coming to terms with his own ignorance and things like that, right? I, I would suggest though that what I'd like you to think about, and you draw your own conclusions, is if you think about this notion of cultural hegemony, that is largely private institutions in the United States, disproportionately influencing the language that we use, the meaning of the language we use, and so the bandwidth which in we can transmit a narrative, which is narrow. Okay, it's not government oppression. It's not, it's not a police state. It doesn't need to be because private institutions control almost all of it. Okay, that's really the part of that hegemony article I'd like you to look at. And I, I'd like to, if, if, you, if you want, I, I, I'm gonna, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna leave it to the two presenters of that hegemony article. Um, do you wanna take another go at that or would you rather just not do the presentation and write about it? What would you rather do? I mean, I'd rather take another swing at presenting it. Okay. Just in yeah. my opinion. Lillian, you want to? Yeah. And again, I don't want you to, it wasn't that you did anything wrong. I just think there was a lot there that you didn't have a chance to kind of make sense of. It, it's a pretty densely written article. Yeah. So we'll, and and, okay. and we were quickly messaging and came to the consensus that we had focused on the wrong aspects of the article. Um, and kind of missed the point. So yeah, I, I would definitely like a diff another chance to present on it. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah, we can do that. We can do that because I think it's worth thinking about. And also, 
and, and Brett's talked about this a little bit. Jared's talked about it a little bit. I think the discussion of the beats implied a little bit of this in terms of, you know, this commercial culture running head on into the beats and the beatniks and the attempt to trivialize the beats and commodify and monetize them and all that. This is that struggle over hegemony that's at the core of consumer capitalism. And this, the only article I could find that kind of helped with that, even though I admit it's a challenging one, is this hegemony article. So give that another go. We'll have a look at that next week, just briefly, you know, I don't, we don't need to ring you dry, but, you know, I'll give you a running start at it. And then we'll move on to the last module. Um, in the meantime, I noticed that at least as of the beginning of class, only seven of you have even begun to enter notes. I'm going to remind you yet again that that is a technical requirement of every module, whether you're writing or presenting. I need to see those. Some of you did not present notes for module two. Some of you did not for module one. Shame on you. You know, I, I'm, I'm the hegemon and I'm telling you, you have to. What I'm telling you is there's value in doing that. There's value for you. It, it will help you prepare either for your written material or for your in-class presentation. But also it compels you to go to the material instead of blowing it off and thinking, well, I'll just kind of listen in when people present it and Bill will Bill will tell me everything that's important anyway, and then I'll just try to repeat that when I write my paper. You don't think I can see that? <laughs> you know, come on, man. I, I'm pretty good at this. I've been around for a while. Um, so I would suggest, you know, before you do your assignment, which is now I put on there, right, uh, that the assignment, the written assignment would be due on Sunday because that's when we normally do it. Is, is that a problem? Do any of you have like midterms pressing against you or anything like that? Do you need more time or... That, that should be enough time, but if it's not, I need to know now. Okay? Because even, even for, the, for those of you who are presenting next week, that's not going to affect you because that deadline doesn't apply to you. Okay? Does that make sense? So you've got, if you look on the, on the um, Moodle page now, you'll see, the, you'll see the link for the module three notes, and then below that, you'll see module three assignment, Cold War and Media, um, you know, explain how media intersected with political forces. Now, remember, we're talking about politics very broadly. When we're talking about hegemony, we're talking about the terms of order. We're talking about social forces. We're talking about the, the framework of public outcomes and things like that. If you read that coverage of Nixon, if you read, you know, that, that story about Aslan and all that, if you read those things, it's clear there's politics in that. Okay. So it's politics very broadly. You can think of it more as political culture, if you want political values, uh, radicalism, conservatism, consensus, dissent, whatever, okay? Think of it as broadly as you want to, any two or more articles. Uh, now, is there anybody who's not sure what that assignment is about, okay? How media intersected with political forces in the period from the end of World War II to the 1970s, okay? One of the things I'm reminding you of there, every time you use a source, you need to cite it. Some of you still are not doing that. Technically, that is plagiarism, okay? Now, if the source has page numbers, you put the author name and the page number. Because what I'm doing is, sometimes I've, I can see that you've misread something. So then I have to go back and try and find it because it may be strange to you, I haven't memorized completely every one of these articles. I have to go back and skim them to find, well, where did that come from? You know, I know it's in there, but I gotta know what the quote is so I can explain that it was misread. Okay, so be sure that you're citing your sources. Any other questions? All right, so those are due on Sunday at 11, Sunday night. And then on, on next Thursday, we'll go over the hegemony article one more time. And then I'll give you a really brief overview of module four. Okay, there are one, two, three, six readings, okay, that we need to do there. And um, I, th I think what we'll do is we won't be doing any presentations next week. I'll, I'll do just an overview of things and contextualize things. And then next week, we'll go ahead and assign the six readings for presentation. Okay? All right. And remember, you're required to do two presentations and two, two writing assignments. There are still a couple of you who owe me a writing assignment and the um, likelihood of amnesty is receding rapidly. It is, as I mentioned several times, your responsibility to get a hold of me and work out how you're going to go about fixing that. Okay. All right. Anything else? 
All right. Then have a good weekend and I will see you. Um, I will see you next week. <laughs>